Okay. okay, so um, I hope you're all here for the CBOR lightning tutorial. Uh, I'm Carsten Bormann, those slides are at this point here. Sorry, it somehow magically turned on. We don't know why it didn't for five minutes, but then it somehow did. Um, so in, in this uh, lighting tutorial, I want to cover three questions. One is, what is CBO and when might you want it? Uh, second is, how does it work? And the third one, how do you work uh, with it? So let's talk about CBO. And I'm going to steal some slides from David Crockford here, who was the uh, inventor of uh, JSON. So, Okay. So, um, 30 years ago or 40 years ago, we were all writing our COBOL programs and uh, uh, generating data formats completely ad hoc. Then we started integrating 
around databases. And then finally XML came along and we had a common data format that we used for uh, interchanging uh, information. XML is originally a document format, but it can be used for interchanging uh, data. It's just a little bit remote from what you uh, would want to use. And finally, people came, came up with interchange formats that are actually based on how programming languages uh, would want to represent uh, data. And this is uh, the thing that, that JSON uh, finally became the most uh, used instance of. So the JSON format for interchanging data um, is uh, the basis for a lot of work right now, both in the ITF and, and generally in the application uh, interoperation environment. Now in the IETF, of course, we do our data formats this way. So uh, there is uh, something called TLVs, type length value representation. And in our RFCs, we uh, write this down in box notation, box notation because we have all these boxes with various uh, things um, in them. Okay, this may, may seem a little bit archaic to uh, some people, but it has served us well. So I'm not uh, trying to belittle this. Uh, this actually works reasonably well. The main problem is that every single new protocol comes up with a new TLV format, and you have to write all these protocol parsers, and these protocol parsers have bugs, and they lead to security problems, uh, and so on. So maybe it, it's time to move on. And the obvious next step is on this slide. Uh, so this is how, how your typical XML document looks like after a few iterations. Uh, and uh, so uh, you want to specify this because this, of course, no longer can, can be reasonably described. Uh, so we have another thing called uh, the XSL XML uh, schema uh, language, XSD. And for reasons unknown to mankind, the people who did, invented this decided to write this down in XML. So it is as unreadable as the, the XML. Uh, there's some, something called RelaxNG that helps a little bit. Um, but uh, yeah, generally application programmers are not too fond of this. You can make it work. Uh, the Java environment helps you with that a lot. Uh, there are tools out there and so on and so on. Uh, but we, uh, in the last 10 years, people have been convert, uh, converging on the JavaScript object notation, JSON. And the idea for JSON was that it is minimal, that it is text-based. And in order to stop all these discussions, when you define a new data format, then there are 2 million people who, who can do that as well. And they all have an idea how to do this and they want to do it slightly differently from you. And just to stop these discussions, David uh, Crockford uh, decided to put this as a subset of JavaScript. So he took the object notation of JavaScript and uh, used that as the interchange format. Of course, that helps with uh, acceptance in the JavaScript com community because it's a very natural data format for them. And for every, everybody else, it just means uh, you don't get a turn at saying, how about changing this comma into a semicolon and, and make, putting it in a space there? No, it's all defined in JavaScript. Uh, so um, this was a, a pretty quick uh, standard uh, to establish. Now, JavaScript has a certain data model. And in JavaScript, you have strings, text strings, numbers, booleans, something that's called objects, which in most other languages are called dictionaries or tables, arrays, and the null value. So that, that's the data model. And that's the underlying model of uh, behind all JSON. Um, data items. So an array in JSON might look like this. Of course, you can have nested arrays. 
and so on. And a table uh, or called object in uh, JSON might look like this. Uh, who's familiar with JSON in this room? Okay, so it, it's a pretty well-known uh, format by now. These things are called objects because in JavaScript they are called uh, objects. So, so for, for a computer scientist, these are really maps. Uh, and that's the term I'm going to use in the next uh, 20 minutes. Now, the nice thing about JSON is you don't need schema information for ingesting this information. Uh, you just point a generic parser at the JSON document and it uh, gives you this structure with arrays, maps, strings, and so on as a programming language uh, object and you can start uh, working from that uh, right away, away. And most programming languages have something like Boolean types, number types, string types, uh, a special null value, uh, some form of maps and, and some form of uh, arrays. Uh, when you define uh, a JSON object, then you often will want to use uh, what is called objects or maps in uh, JSON as structures. So you, uh, like in, in the example here, uh, you use uh, the names in the map just as indication what, what the thing on the right side of the colon actually means. So you say width, and then you give a number that is to be interpreted uh, as a width. So this is the, the typical way in which you do uh, structured information in JSON, but you also can just use arrays and uh, uh, define the uh, meaning of a position in the array, something that I would call record uh, usage. Now, one of the nice things about this is that um, in a key value structure in this map um, approach, you can just add new keys by uh, new, new items by defining new keys and uh, generally JSON consuming applications just ignore what they don't understand. So this is a way to do evolution. Um, if you want to put new information into uh, a data format that, that applications already understand, you just use new key names and uh, then um, yeah, the old applications will still work, but of course they won't understand the new information that they didn't know about. Okay, so this is JSON, and JSON is, is well established, works very well, um, but it does have its limitations. And that is particularly interesting in the constraint space where we do Internet of Things types of applications. And the, the biggest problem really is that uh, JSON doesn't have any idea of binary data. Of course not, because it's a text format. Uh, so uh, you, you wouldn't have an easy way to put in uh, binary data. Um, but also, it, it's really a format that originally was meant for a programming language, not for data interchange. So for instance, all numbers are in decimal. And it is actually surprisingly hard uh, to convert between decimal and binary representations of numbers. Not for integers numbers, that's trivial, but for floating point numbers, it's, it's really an art that has uh, taken about a quarter century until we fully understood it. When you implement something in JSON, then you usually have to do copying because strings uh, use quotes around them. And if there is a quote in a string, you have to do escaping uh, and so on. And uh, well, if you somehow do want to use binary, then you use something like base64 encoding, and that also requires uh, copying. Uh, JSON was deliberately designed not to be extensible. So JSON is JSON. Uh, if you do want to have some additional representation types beyond the seven that I showed, string number and so on, um, the, the only thing you can do is use something like the structure format uh, that I showed and say date colon and then put in your date font. 
So you cannot add uh, new types at the representation level, you only can add them at the semantic uh, level. Finally, at the implementation level, we know, know about interoperability issues in JSON. There's a whole RFC that tells you how to use JSON in, in a way that minimizes uh, interoperability uh, issues. And the, the, the ugly thing here is that this uh, reduces the expressibility uh, you have when, when using uh, JSON. So for a long time, I, I have used this slide here in, in my uh, talks about data formats. The XML people actually have at some point defined something called XE, which is their efficient XML interchange uh, binary format for, for sending around XML data. And we just had no idea how to do this in, in JSON. Um, so over time, JSON is, is now more than 10 years old. Uh, a lot of people have defined their own binary JSONs. And uh, one, one of them is called Bison. And uh, that's actually the most cited one. If, if somebody thinks about binary JSON, they are going to say Bison just because the abbreviation is so great, not because the format is so great. The format is, is really not so great. But Bison is not the only one of those. There are dozens uh, of them. And they, have, they all have different uh, objectives. So uh, they're, not, they're not just trying to do a binary JSON, but they have specific ideas in mind. So for instance, Bison was designed for a specific database, the MongoDB, and its uh, uh, main design feature is that you can update data at rest. So when you have a Bison representation in your a database, you might want to increment a number in the middle of that representation. And that, for instance, means Bison cannot really use variable length numbers. It has to use fixed length numbers. So this, this update in place works. So you see that, that different requirements, different areas of application lead to different uh, binary JSONs. And again, there, there are like 20 of them around now. And interestingly, most of them are actually more complex to implement than JSON. You would expect when you go to binary, there's, it's much easier to convert um, between uh, the binary interchange format and the binary representation within the computer, but that's not the case. These formats are often complex. So uh, when we started looking at data interchange formats in the constraint space where we might have a microcontroller with something like uh, 128 kilobytes of, of uh, code, uh, we were thinking about a way to get this simple. We wanted to build something simple and um, focus on small code size and compact data size. But in this order, the, 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 the implementation was supposed to be simple. Um, so you can actually implement it in a small number of codes and, and my C implementation is 822 bytes of code, not kilobytes, not megabytes, bytes of code on, on an arm. So um, this was one of the objectives uh, here to be useful in the IoT space. Um, so the data size was supposed to be compact, uh, but not with extensive bit fiddling which would have increased the, the uh, code size again, uh, but uh, just with a very natural mapping between the uh, uh, in, internal representation types and the interchange uh, types. So um, two years ago, um, three years ago, we actually started writing this up and came up with something which is called concise binary object representation. How did we get this? Title, well, this is JSON, but it's not a notation, it's a representation, so it's object <laughs> representation. And it's not JavaScript, and the, the two most important uh, attributes here are it's con concise, it's meant to be simple, and so on, and it's binary. So how do you pronounce this? C-ball, what is a C-ball? Maybe something like this. Um, okay, 
So um, after we defined this, um, we can finally fill in this field in, in the uh, table. So um, more specifically, the design goals were uh, being able to encode all the data that we actually use in, in IoT and generally in IETF uh, protocols. Um, make a compact implementation possible. That's the code size thing. Uh, being able to pass without a schema description, that's the same thing as with JSON. And that's very different, for instance, from XC, uh, which you usually would uh, want to use together with a, a schema description uh, to get compact representation. This compactness thing is secondary to implementation compactness. So simplicity was more important to us than getting the last bit of efficiency out of it. Um, our main two target areas were constraint nodes, those IoT things, light switches, and high volume applications. So applications where you don't really want to uh, throw a lot of code complexity at consuming or producing uh, the data. Um, this is not HDF5 or something like that. It's not, not optimized for uh, uh, sending around terabyte sized databases. Uh, but still, you might have high volume applications where you are sending around lots of, for instance, sensor uh, measurements. And you want to do this in an efficient uh, way. Uh, we wanted to support all JSON data types uh, with a defined conversion to and from uh, JSON. And finally, we wanted the format to be extensible. So we are taking a different stance here from JSON, which is deliberately not trying to be extensible. Uh, but uh, we think protocol evolution usually requires some extensibility. So um, pretty much uh, two years ago, we finally got an RFC out of that. And uh, people since have actually started implementing that. And th there is a website called cbo.io that actually collects information about what's out there in uh, the implementation space. OK, so let's talk a little bit about how it works. Um, now, if I, I was telling you how JSON works, I would probably use these wonderful racetrack diagrams, syntax diagrams, uh, and so on. But of course, CBOR is binary. So a CBOR uh, instance looks like this. Um, again, the point was to have a binary interchange uh, format. This, by the way, is a, a table out of uh, RFC 7049 uh, that shows this piece of data in various uh, formats. Uh, we actually now also have RFC 731 in that table, which is interesting. Very early RFC that get, got most of the things right, more, more so than what has uh, come uh, in between. Anyway, so th this is how things uh, look like. Now, um, if you uh, look more closely, uh, a data item has an initial byte that tells you what it is. And this initial byte is divided in, into a three-bit field and a five-bit field. So the three-bit field tells you which of these eight major types uh, you are having. And the other five bits tell you something like length information, or if it's just an integer, it, it might be the integer. So the major types are unsigned, zero or positive, and negative integers, byte strings. This is the binary data I was talking about. Uh, text strings, and text in 2015 means UTF-8. Arrays, yes? Unsigned and negative should be unsigned and signed. That would have been one way of doing things. But we decided we, we would have all positive and zero numbers in the unsigned major type and all negative integers in the other side. Um, if, if you know protocol buffers, they have this interesting thing called zigzag encoding. And this is essentially a way to do zigzag encoding without uh, having to shift around 
uh, the data. So we put the uh, least significant bit of the zigzag encoding into the major type and, and the rest is uh, in, in the data field. Um, so we have arrays, we have maps, uh, we have something called tags, I'll get to this in, in a minute, and the simple types like uh, booleans, null, uh, and also the floating point uh, values. So this is IEEE 754 uh, floating point values. So what do we do with, the, with these five bits? Um, if those five bits are a value between zero and 23, it's an immediate value. So uh, for instance, uh, encoding the number zero gives you a byte with a zero in the major type and a zero in the immediate value, and that's all you need for that. And values between 24 and 27 mean that a few more bytes follow, one, two, four, and eight. Um, there are some reserved values. And finally, we have a screening uh, mechanism where if, if you don't know uh, how many data you will have, um, this indicates there will be a terminator at the end uh, of the sequence of uh, data items. Um, yeah, so, so this, the immediate value, all the one, two, four, and eight bytes a value that follow generates an unsigned integer. And for major type zero and one, that is the integer, either directly or in, in, one, in one's complement. For seven, this is an uh, enumeration type uh, for things like true, false, null, or undefined. Or it might actually be the IEEE 754 uh, representation of a floating point number. For types two and three, it's the length for types, length in bytes, uh, for types four and five, it's a count in items or item pairs for maps, or it might be a tag value. Let's come, come to that um, in a minute. So the major type seven is doing these false, true, null, undef values, and we, we have an IANA registry if, if we ever need more of them. Uh, so far, we haven't. And um, if we are using the, the values for two bytes, four bytes, or eight bytes, uh, actually the, the uh, value in there is a half, a single, or a double uh, floating point. And finally, tags. Uh, that's an interesting uh, idea. So how do we make this format extensible? Uh, we defined one major type, which allows you to associate a number with a value, and those numbers might, um, well, these are registered values, and they tell you what, what that value actually is. So for instance, number zero means um, the value is a text string that uh, is structured according to ISO 8601 in the RFC 3339 form. Uh, one means this is a Unix time a number relative, number of seconds relative to 90. Uh, 70 generally first. We have big nums, we have decimal fractions, big floats, um, and a few other things that, that not everybody needs, um, but uh, that are useful to, to have predefined uh, if you uh, need them. And anyone can go ahead and register a tag. Um, the, the good numbers, the short numbers, require a little bit higher uh, level of effort. Uh, but we have enough tags uh, that, that uh, we will be able to register a few of them. So um, the Perl community, for instance, have, have immediately picked this up and uh, done a few tags for Perl-specific um, things, like the Perl reference. You uh, express 22098 in binary, it's RV reference value which is what Perl people think is exactly the right thing this tag uh, should be. Uh, so tags can be defined for specific applications, and we might want to uh, define a few more of these more general purpose uh, tags here. Uh, so for instance, uh, ASM1 object identifiers, uh, tagged arrays, 
uh, like you have in JavaScript. Um, um, th these are examples for, for things we might be uh, defining as generic uh, tags. So this means, um, well, you probably have to, to digest this slide here in a little bit more time or read the equivalent table in uh, RFC 7049. But a zero is represented as zero, a one as one, a 23 as 16, a 17 hex, and a 24 as 18, 18 hex, because, well, the 70, uh, 24 is the first one that doesn't fit into the immediate value in the first byte. Uh, so we use a one byte extension and uh, write the 18 in there. And 100 is 1864, and 1000 is 1903E8, and the million is this. It's pretty straightforward, and it's very easy to, to decode. Now, at some point, we are leaving the 64-bit space, and then we are going to big numbers, which actually contain a tag. C2 means uh, C is a six, byte, uh, six uh, multiplied by two. Um, so it's a tag with a value two, and this is the byte string that uh, represents that value. These are negative numbers, floating points, um, infinity, nan, uh, minus infinity. These are all defined in IEEE 754, so it's easy to transport them in, in uh, CBOR. There's no way to write them in JSON. False, true, and null are these simple types. And then we have hex strings, um, text strings, and uh, arrays, and maps. Now, the interesting thing about maps is you can use any data type as a map key, not, not like in JSON where you only have strings. So this is how it works. Again, I could talk hours about that, but uh, I think it should be obvious. There really is not more to it. So you could implement it from those three slides. So how do you work with it? First of all, if you just want to play around with it, there is a CBOR playground called CBOR.ne. And uh, this essentially is two uh, fields where you can either put in something that looks like JSON or put in bytes and press the, these conversion uh, arrows and it will convert between one or the other uh, representation. So this is for playing around. Now, the, the thing here looks like JSON, uh, but it's not limited to JSON. We have to find a diagnostic notation for SIBO. So we have a common way of talk, to talk about uh, SIBO values in text form. So we can represent binary strings and tags and so on uh, in this. Uh, diagnostic notation format defined in section six of the uh, RFC. Okay, if you want to do more than playing around with it, you probably want an implementation. Um, there are a couple more than 25 implementations uh, right now for a couple languages like JavaScript, PHP, Go, Rust. The Rust community has been particularly emphatic in, in uh, picking up Cbo. I have no idea why. Uh, Lua, Python, Perl, Ruby, Erlang, and Elixir, Haskell, C Sharp, Java, C, C++, and D. Any of your favorite programming languages that's missing? Okay. Pardon me? Well, that's Java. So if, if, you, if you need it on the Java virtual machine, you use the Java implementation and just link it to, to uh, whatever you need on top of it. It's, it's just a one call. Can't quite see this, but uh, yeah, go, go to that thing. Lisp, yeah. Somebody has to do a Lisp implementation. It's probably going to be one line in Lisp or something. <laughs> Okay, so this is, uh, if, if you are using it like JSON, that's really a, uh, all you need to know because it, it will just work. Um, now, when we write text-based specifications, we have something called ABNF that allows us to, to write in a slightly more formal way uh, what uh, pieces of text are actually uh, meant here. And actually, if you look into the history of the RFCs, 
the first RFC that uses uh, a form of BNF is RFC 40 from 1969, I think. Uh, so uh, that, that has a very long history. In, in the ITF, we always have described uh, text-based protocols using something like uh, BNF. So we, we thought, um, is there maybe something like, like a BNF for JSON-like uh, data models? And of course, there, there's a ton of proposals how to do schema languages uh, from JSON. You could use one of those schema languages, and, and it would also probably uh, do the same thing. But we try to, to limit this to um, essentially the function of ABNF. And we actually uh, copied the syntax of ABNF, so it looks uh, relatively uh, similar. But the, the theory behind it is really the theory behind RelaxNG. So if you know what, what RelaxNG is, uh, you will feel at home very quickly. There's another proposal called JSON Content Rules, where we stole the rest <laughs> of of the, the great idea. So uh, very little of this is innovation, but um, I think we have put it uh, together quite nicely. And we now have something called a Seaboard data definition language. That has been stable for a year or so. Uh, we're still adding a few things to it uh, where we learn from, from the actual specification work going on in CDDL that uh, we want to make a few additions. There also is a tool available. Um, this tool is user friendly, but only to the users that it likes. Um, so, uh, well, it sometimes is, is a little bit verbose in its error messages. Um, but uh, the, the main use of this tool is either to generate an example instance. So you have a CDDL specification and it's just going to generate a random instance that is conforming to that. That can be very enlightening. Um, there's something called ABNF gen, if you are writing AB, ABNF that does the same thing. Um, or you have a way to check an instance against uh, the definition. And that's what we use for writing specifications. We want to know whether the examples we have in the uh, document are uh, conforming. So this is an example how a large part of RFC 7071 would have looked in CDDL. That's actually a JSON spec, but because JSON is a subset of Seaboard, of course, CDDL can, can describe uh, JSON documents as well. So a reputation object is a map with two keys, application and reputons, where application is a text value and reputons is an array of zero or more reputons. And the reputon is a map that has a rater, which is a text, an assertion that it is a text, a rater that it is a text, a rating, which, well, okay, we took a little liberty here, is a float 16, assuming that you don't need a lot of accuracy on that uh, rating. And then it has a number of optional components, confidence, normal rating, sample size is an unsigned integer, generated is an unsigned integer, expired, expires is an unsigned integer, and then it has some extensibility, so you can go ahead and define additional entries for that map. So that's pages, I don't know, five pages out of that uh, RFC. Um, so th that is the retroactive. We have looked at 7071 as an example of, of a document that has a not completely trivial JSON representation and uh, it takes days to read the, the description and it takes five minutes to understand this uh, stuff. And for, for new development, uh, we have an example here, which is RASP. RASP is the generic autonomic signaling protocol uh, used in, in uh, autonomic management uh, of systems. And uh, the RASP people for once have decided not to invent another TLV for this. That would, of course, be the natural thing. You define another TLV but they have decided to, to just use SIBO. And uh, so for instance, a GRASP message is an array with uh, three uh, elements, a message type, a session ID, and uh, zero or more options. So actually it's not three elements, it's two to any number of elements. And the message type is 123, the session ID is uh, 
value up to 16 million and options uh, are defined like this. So waiting time option is one of the options that is actually an array uh, containing the awaiting value and the waiting time, uh, which is a number in uh, milliseconds. So it's pretty straightforward. It looks a lot like A, B, and F, um, but it's, uh, the, the square brackets, of course, don't mean optional here, but they mean array uh, as in uh, JSON. Okay, last slide. Where do you go from here? Well, first of all, you go to RFC 7049. Uh, then maybe you go to cbot.io. You might want to subscribe to the CBOR mailing list, which is relatively quiet, um, but uh, maybe a good way to, to uh, find people to talk to. The CDDL document is not in RFC yet because we still wanted what to learn from uh, specification efforts, but we expect to, to move it forward uh, to, to a working group and, and then to standards flag document next year. And finally, the EDU team has asked me for, for all of you to go to this place here and tell us how good this lightning tutorial was. Questions? Thank you. Yeah. 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 Yeah.